I always thought backpacking was something only white people did. Growing up in Bangkok, which was arguably one of the biggest backpacker hubs, I was accustomed to seeing an endless stream of farangs, or, you know, the Thai term for white foreigner, as they arrived in the country, armed with their rucksacks, guidebooks, and the wide-eyed hope for adventure. Meanwhile, like many other Asian cultures, my Thai upbringing emphasized hard work, studying, and increasing one's level of comfort. The idea of purposefully throwing off said comfort to live out of a backpack was very, very foreign in all capacities. South African comedian Trevor Noah once joked something similar about camping. He said his ancestors didn't work so hard to get out of the bush just so he could go back into the bush. Backpacking to find oneself was not a rite of passage in the same way that it is in a lot of other Western cultures. And so, though my single mother always saw the value in travel, we were way more touristy than intrepid travelers. We opted for organized excursions, cruises, and trips with friends and family. The idea of ever going off by myself into the unknown was way too scary to ever comprehend. I was working in an office job in Los Angeles when a trip to South Africa changed everything. Far from the urban sprawls of Cape Town and Johannesburg lies part of the country that few venture to. It's where you can wake up to a blazing sunrise over the ocean, you can surf your soul away, and you can also swim with the biggest underwater migration on Earth. This place is known as the Wild Coast. The sole purpose of my visit? To photograph what's known as the Sardine Run. Despite its misnomer, the Sardine Run has nothing to do with running marathons. I am definitely not fit enough for that. Nicknamed the Blue Serengeti, the Sardine Run is an event larger in number than the wildebeest migration of Eastern Africa. Millions of fish are moving up the coast, huddling into tight bait balls as a form of protection, the shoals often stretching for kilometers long. And with these fish come the predators that hunt them. Think swimming with sharks, whales, dolphins, even birds as they're chasing around these fish in frenetic, frenzied feeding. Basically, if anyone has seen the TV show Entourage, I went from swimming with sharks in Hollywood to swimming with actual sharks. I spent my days in the open ocean, diving into bottomless blues and returning to the backpacker's lodge later in the evening to sit around a campfire with other backpackers as we jammed on broken five-string guitars under the stars. I didn't really know it back then, but the experience would change my life forever. Upon returning to California, I couldn't shake this feeling of ennui, this restlessness that there must be something more. At that point, I was barely 24, and I was working at a talent agency representing book-to-film rights. But I often felt that I was spending so much time helping other people tell their stories that I was forgetting to live my own. To be so close to the creative process and also unable to do it myself was too painful for me to bear. And so I did the very un-Asian thing and I quit. As someone who's always been a chronic over-planner, the idea of the yawning, gaping unknown was absolutely terrifying and also surprisingly exhilarating. You see, life is hard for two reasons, because you're leaving your comfort zone or because you're staying in it. In scuba diving, we have this act called the giant stride. It's where you stand at the edge of the boat and you do a large step into the ocean. That was my goal, to embrace the giant stride into the unknown. French poet Francois Rabelais once said, I go to seek a great perhaps. And so, strapping on my backpack, I left the familiar to go and seek mine. After all, we often regret the things we didn't do more than the things that we did do I saw this slogan once at a bungee jumping spot in South Africa that said, fear is temporary, regret is permanent. That really resonated with me. And despite having an immense fear of heights, it was enough to encourage me to take the 200 meter plunge down to the abyss. <laughs> Basically the most expensive seven seconds of my life. Very smart marketing. The goal of my trip wasn't to go on a holiday. 
It was to be challenged, embrace discomfort, and to grow. And to also challenge certain myths regarding solo female travel. You know, most people warned me, you're gonna get kidnapped or ransomed or murdered. Spoiler alert, I survived. I wound up solo backpacking across 20 countries and five continents, spending most of my time in Southern Africa. On this journey, I hitched a ride with a stranger in a combi, swim with bioluminescent plankton in Colombia, swim with 20 whales in a heat run, as a, basically a mating ritual in Tonga, saw the world's largest bat migration in Zambia, trekked across landmine-infested territory in Bosnia, learned how to surf in Mozambique, and of course, I swam with sharks. It was female explorer Frey Stark who perhaps said it best. To awaken quite alone in a strange town is one of the most pleasant sensations in the world. You're surrounded by adventure. Standing at the top of the second highest waterfall in the world, after hiking through sunshine, rain, and hail all the same day, I remember thinking, I could be in the office right now. But the life-changing experience were, weren't always so bucket listy. You know, sometimes they're smaller, quieter moments of resonance, daily sunsets, you know, sitting in bumpy bus rides, sharing a dorm room with backpackers from all corners of the world, sitting in the back of a pickup truck as local kids chase after us, yelling, Muzungu, Muzungu, which means white person, and then seeing them pause as their eyes landed on you as a solo female traveler, an Asian, was not a really common sight in that part of the world. In regular life, we're so defined by what we do for a living that sometimes we forget to actually live. None of that matters on the road. You know, the freedom to be whoever you want to be is immensely liberating. You don't have to carry any of that baggage that you did from your previous life, save for the actual bags on your back. And the transience creates this sort of freedom of expression, of openness. Perhaps that's why they call it the open road. This was the magic of backpacking, disappearing off the map, reinventing yourself, making new friends. But amidst the beauty, there's also various forms of privilege that exists on the road. Gender, economic, color, religion, passport. Sure, I was roughing it by staying in eight-person dorm rooms, but I was lucky enough to not live paycheck to paycheck and to be able to afford time off work to travel at all. And there's this term, romantic primitivism, which talks about the idea that noble savages elsewhere always have it better. And trustafarians on the road will often tout the perfection of foreign places, you know, frequently ones in less developed countries, Thailand, Bali, you name it. But this is merely a symptom of romanticizing and idealizing these cultures without really understanding them as a whole. I remember sitting in a 4x4, winding up the Sani Pass, this infamously treacherous route that splits South Africa with the mountain kingdom of Lesotho, when we saw a man carrying firewood on his back. For me, it was a moment of stark realization that while some of us strapped on a backpack to go in, into the wild and eat, pray, love, living out these Kerouac fantasies, others carry things on their back out of necessity. We often forget that travel is a privilege and not a right. And in no place does this become more apparent than in Africa. My point isn't to disregard the fun aspects of backpacking, but just like embracing depth in scuba diving, it's to encourage you to travel a little deeper. The places we go shouldn't serve as just pretty Instagram backdrops relegated as you know, backgrounds for our journeys of self-discovery and self-actualization. We are real places inhabited by real people. Take the time to genuinely find out what that means. In my case, it meant learning about neocolonialism, the counterintuitiveness and the pitfalls of foreign aid, and depth trap diplomacy. Now, your vocabulary and vernacular may grow exponentially as a result. Some say that in the age of TripAdvisor and Lonely Planet, true exploration is dead. I would like to challenge that. I think that if you travel deeper, you'll find out that so much of the world has yet to be discovered. After all, I don't think Google Maps can go underwater yet. Africa challenged so many preconceived notions I had of both myself and the continent and showed me that no matter where we're from, 
we really are more alike than we're different. Especially since it seems that every single backpacker knows the lyrics to Wonderwall. The thing is, travel can feel a lot like falling in love. Both have the exhilarating rush of discovery and that feeling of wonder. That's why road romances are so potent. They exist in this completely separate, separate travel bubble, and it's really easy to conflate hostels with home. You know, people want excitement, but safety, stimulation, and stability. And it's almost near impossible to achieve both, let alone permanently. It struck me that this dichotomy is perhaps best represented by a Volkswagen Kombi, this common symbol you see on Instagram for the vagabonding van life. It's what humans crave most, both in life and in people. The adventure of the road and the comfort of home. And that's why, like a lost love, it takes time to get over travel. It's only after processing the reverse culture shock that its true value blooms in hindsight. Your heart almost feels like it's bursting from the richness of the places, the faces, and the people you've come to know. You know, the world feels so much larger, yet also so much smaller and connected at the same time. There's really no way to sum up everything into a palatable lesson, a single one, except that the experience is larger than some of its parts. The true measure of how far you've gone shouldn't be by mileage, flights, or hitchhike rides, but it's really the distance you've journeyed within. The travel writer Ralph Potts once said, exploration is not so much a covering of surface distance as it is a study in depth. I spent a year trying to recapture the serendipity of the sardine run. What I discovered was that you can never replicate that first time, but you can find so much more if you travel with your heart, your mind, and your eyes wide open. After all, isn't the transience what makes it beautiful? Swimming with sharks taught me to face my fears and find comfort in uncertainty, and to recognize that if you have the privilege to ever backpack, it is as wholeheartedly an opportunity you should take. There's a common misconception that travel has no link to the real world, but by breaking out the traditional path, my time abroad led to working as a film producer for international stories, launching Hollywood's first scuba diving club, and was the inspiration behind my new novel, a book about questioning the comfort of ordinary life and going out there to seek that great perhaps. While in the Drakensberg Mountains in South Africa, I found myself on a film set after meeting two crew members at the local hostel nearby. Flash forward one year later, and I was working as a film executive at Sony Pictures, and I was meeting with a South African filmmaker. Upon telling him about the story, he paused and he asked, what was the name of that film? Turns out, he had written it. The best analogy I can think of while backpacking is that sometimes you'll run into the same people on the road. And similarly, if you follow your passions, you'll be surprised at where those roads intersect. I came back from Africa almost three years ago, but the memories constantly linger in the back of my mind. See, we age not by years, but by stories, and I've spent a lifetime chasing stories to tell when I'm old. In turn, I'd love to encourage you to live your own story and to embrace that giant stride into the unknown. Thank you.